a wonderful introduction. It's great to be here today over Zoom and uh, to see to see all of you. Um, so I'll go ahead and start screen sharing. Um, there we go. And I'll go ahead and open the slide deck um, and go ahead and uh, get started. I think generally speaking, my plan here is to spend about 45 minutes or so um, introducing Newspaper Navigator and leave sort of ample time for questions. Um, so um, as, as mentioned, so this work is very much in collaboration with the Library of Congress. And in particular, I wanted to highlight the uh, LC Labs team um, for making this project possible, specifically through their Innovator Residence Program. Um, and also wanted to mention um, IT design and development at the Library of Congress, as well as what's known as the National Digital Newspaper Program. And I'll give some more context for that shortly. And then also, of course, um, to mention the University of Washington, um, where I've simultaneously been working on this work um, as part of my uh, dissertation as well. Um, and with that, let me go ahead and just give a, a very brief outline of the, the talk today. So I'm going to approach Newspaper Navigator from three separate angles. The first one will be introducing the Newspaper Navigator data set for extracting visual content. The second um, portion of the talk will be um, uh, demoing the Newspaper Navigator search application. And then lastly, really trying to think about Newspaper Navigator downstream in digital history and the digital humanities more broadly, and then we'll turn to questions. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and give some context for the collection that Newspaper Navigator is built on. And this collection is known as Chronicling America. So Chronicling America is a database of now over 20 million pages of digitized historic newspaper pages from across the United States. Um, so generally speaking, this content is contributed from libraries and other donors across the United States and territories. And um, it's produced by what is known as the National Digital Newspaper Program, which here in the United States is a partnership between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. Uh, I should mention that all of these pages are in the public domain, um, and this makes it a really vast resource for use and reuse uh, by the American public and beyond. And also it supports full sort of API and bulk data access. Um, the, in particular, this collection is great to be able to uh, compute against, and um, this sort of infrastructure built out by the Library of Congress really made this project possible. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and give some context for the, the newspaper pages in the collection. So here is a, a map showing the number of newspaper pages digitized by state. Um, this visualization is actually from about uh, 2020 when I started the project. Um, so at the time, it contained about 47 states plus additional um, territories and Washington, D.C. Um, but I'll mention that this number has since increased um, since 2020. Um, here's a, a more granular view looking at uh, various counties. Um, I like this because it gives a sense of how local so many of these newspaper pages are and also just how many counties are covered in one way uh, or another by Chronicling America. Um, in terms of the temporal coverage, um, the collection at the time spanned uh, 1789 to 1963. We see you know, a real sort of critical mass of the collection from 1875 to 1923. Um, that precipitous drop that we see is largely due to um, uh, US copyright law and what papers were automatically considered in the public domain. But I will mention that Generally speaking, you know, even for pre-1875 papers, we see over a million of them. And so it's really possible to study any portion of American history using this collection. Um, I'll also mention the, uh, the, the, the linguistic distribution of the collection as well. And so here is a visualization put together by my colleague, Nathan Yara Savage of that National Digital Newspaper Program Initiative, um, showing the number of non-English pages. And I like this visualization because it gives us another sense of the ways in which Chronicling America is really a diverse collection to work with. Um, but let me go ahead and give a sense of what it looks like if you visit the portal and actually try to look at some newspaper pages. So um, the front page of Chronicling America, or the home page, I should say, typically features front pages from about 100 years ago. And so um, these two front pages are ones you might encounter. And um, we can access them in a number of ways. So the first, of course, is through a high resolution scan as shown here, you know, in JP2000 or uh, uh, JPEG. And um, we can, of course, uh, search these newspaper pages by newspaper title or date of publication. 
But the whole collection has you know, been OCR'd using optical character recognition, meaning that it's possible to do keyword search against the collection and not just get back um, you know, where, which pages contain certain text um, snippets, but also where the text is localized on the image itself. And of course, as many of us know, OCR is really uh, an incredible resource to help us unlock the textual content on digitized materials. And um, I'd like to think about sort of the anal uh, 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 something analogous here and shifting toward the visual content. Um, but before I go ahead and uh, get there, let me go ahead and um, introduce um, a crowdsourcing initiative launched by the LC Labs team in 2017 called Beyond Words, um, which was particularly crucial for Newspaper Navigator as a project. So in um, this in this crowdsourcing initiative, um, the volunteers were asked to draw bounding boxes around visual content on newspaper pages from the World War I era in Chronicling America. And so there's uh, different kinds of visual content included, say, um, photos, illustrations, maps, comics, editorial cartoons. Um, and in the second step, volunteers were then asked to transcribe the text um, corresponding to the visual content. So um, say the caption of an image. And um, sort of significantly in this process, volunteers didn't just transcribe from scratch, but were actually asked to um, to uh, correct all of the OCR falling within this broader bounding box. And the idea here is that it's um, an initial way of getting a caption is to use the, the OCR in this box, and that's something we'll be um, using later on here in Newspaper Navigator. Um, and I will mention that this uh, crowdsourcing initiative of Beyond Words was really remarkably successful. Um, it accrued thousands of annotations and had uh, volunteers from across the country. And um, I encountered this project um, shortly after it had been launched and some volunteers had extracted some of this visual content. And here's just a little collage I've put together of some of the visual content identified by volunteers. And I um, was really captivated by the visual content. You know, I, um, as somebody who had only encountered newspapers perhaps as a primarily textual source, I found the, 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 rich, the visual content to be so rich and um, really became interested in this question of how we might go beyond looking at say thousands of newspaper pages and trying to extract this visual content at scale. And so to borrow some language from the Library of Congress's you know, digital strategy, the goal was to you know, quote unquote, throw open this treasure chest by training a machine learning algorithm to process the millions of newspaper pages in Chronicling America, here really building on beyond words as a source of training data for the machine learning model. And then once we've extracted this visual content, reimagining how we might search over it with new affordances for visual similarity. And um, so generally speaking, if we can start with raw newspaper pages, the goal is to end up with this fully articulated search interface. And so that's precisely what I'll be talking through here um, for the first two thirds of the talk. So let me go ahead and start with the newspaper navigator data set, which of course starts with this question of how we extract the visual content. So the idea here is if we have two newspaper pages, um, such as the ones shown here, we'd like to be able to feed them into a machine learning model and get back out bounding boxes corresponding to the visual content and not just showing where it is, but also categorizing it. And so here we can leverage this beyond words taxonomy um, and add on a couple of additional classes that might be useful here, thinking of headlines and advertisements. Once we've uh, trained this model and it's returned these bounding boxes, we can also use, sort of inspired by Beyond Words, the underlying OCR in each bounding box. Um, so in the case of headlines, this gives us a transcription of the headline. In the case of an image or a photo, this might give us the caption. So now we not only have the extracted visual content, but some corresponding captions as well. Of course, this will never be perfect. The bounding box is just a sort of first order proxy for what might be a caption and OCR is never perfect as well but this at least gives us some source of textual information about the images as well. So let me go ahead and talk very briefly about what it looks like to train this visual content recognition model. Um, and so, you know, this, I started this portion in, in uh, late 2019. And so certainly lots of, uh, lots has changed in the, in the world of uh, image recognition and especially with these foundation models. Uh, but at the time, the state of the art was uh, this uh, uh, open source library by Facebook AI research called Detectron 2, which hosted all sorts of different um, you know, uh, computer vision models for all sorts of different tasks, including object detection as well. And so 
Um, you know, the idea here was to use these sort of pre-trained models here, a uh, faster RCNN backbone to um, uh, that had been pre-trained on uh, a massive sort of standard benchmarking data set known as common objects in context, and then to train that or fine tune it on the beyond words annotations from uh, the project or the crowdsourcing initiative, plus some additional annotations of headlines and advertisements. And so I know that these names can sometimes be, you know, a bit technical. So let me go ahead and try to give some, some context or some intuition for what's going on here. So object detection, generally speaking, refers to the task of giving an image returning, not just that there is, say, a dog or a bicycle or a truck in the image, but also drawing bounding boxes indicating where the dog or the bicycle or truck are located on the image plane or localized. And so in a sense, there's this really natural resonance between this task on the left, and then of course drawing bounding boxes around say, an advertisement or a cartoon on a newspaper page. And that's precisely what this pre-training and fine tuning paradigm is taking advantage of, and is really the, still remains a, a dominant method for um, training these models. And so the idea here is we take an object detection model from the Tektron 2 that is already really good at um, the task on the left on sort of, uh, photos that you, uh, digital photos you might see, and then training that model some more on the Beyond Words annotations to perform this task on the right. And so then once we have this trained model, we can then feed in the Chronicling America pages and get back out predictions, in effect, allowing us to extract this visual content if we build out a pipeline. So let me very briefly talk a bit about training this visual content recognition model. I'm happy to talk more about the technical details as well, um, but then we'll really try to give some intuition for what the predictions look like as well. Um, so this uh, training took um, about 77 epochs, meaning uh, about uh, 19 hours on a single NVIDIA GPU. Um, and uh, this is uh, means that it's quite inexpensive in terms of time and cost. Um, a lot of the sort of uh, significant computing actually comes with um, performing the inference across all of Chronicling America, as opposed to training the model. Um, here are some hyperparameters, but I do just want to mention very briefly, I'll have some pointers to this later on in the slides, but um, just in the GitHub repo for the project, we have a demo for how to train the model, um, the actual model weights themselves, instructions for using the model in your own project, and then lastly, um, this uh, model is now included in Layout Parser, which is a PIP installable Python library for layout detection across digitized and for digital documents. And thought I'd raise that um, just because it's really um, so much easier to use the visual content recognition model now, just a few lines of code and you can get up and running with it. Um, let me very briefly introduce sort of the performance that, that's been benchmarked here. Um, in the computer vision or object detection world, um, this metric that's commonly used is known as average precision. Um, the primary point of intuition here is the higher the number, the better. Um, but, you know, as a more technical detail, you can effectively evaluate, um, you know, what, uh, whether a prediction is correct or not from an object detection model by seeing how much the, the, how much the box overlaps with the ground truth box by a metric known as intersection over union. And here you can do different threshold cuts on intersection over union to assess, say, true positives or the like. And um, doing this over a bunch of different cuts um, and averaging, it gives us this metric known as quote unquote average precision, an overloaded turn in the literature. But again, the important thing is the higher the number, the better. And so we see that generally speaking, performance is quite good. Um, certainly the highest for headlines and advertisements um, and the sort of lowest here for illustrations. Um, in a sense, this, uh, this aligns with intuition for headlines and advertisements. We have so many um, bounding boxes in the training and in, in validate uh, training data, I should say. Um, whereas for illustrations, there's a you know rather um, a fewer in the actual training data from Beyond Words. Um, and I'll also mention that illustrations um, are just sort of naturally a bit more difficult to differentiate from, um, say, comics or cartoons, but also from photographs because oftentimes, based on the microfilming process. Um, sometimes it's hard to even distinguish photographs from illustrations by eye. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, performance is quite good, and we can actually, you know, do a sort of ablation study and ask how um, well is this uh, visual content recognition performing from the perspective of extracting the visual content as opposed to classifying it into, say, photograph or illustration. And so that's what that metric one class at the bottom refers to. Here we're asking, 
what is the performance of just saying, is this visual content recognition model picking up the bounding box or not, not classifying it correctly? And we see the average precision jumps to about 75%. So this does tell us that some fraction of the um, error is coming from this misclassification across different categories. But with that, I actually find it more useful to maybe look at some example newspaper pages and see what the predictions look like. And so here I'm showing some uh, sample newspaper pages <clears throat> drawn from you know, a held out set. Um, and the bounding boxes each have the predicted class in the top left corner, along with um, a confidence score um, returned by the model in the top left as well. And so generally speaking, we see that the performance is, is quite good. We find that most of the headlines are identified, the advertisements are segmented out properly, photos identified as such. Um, we see, um, in addition, that for some of these complex photo layouts, they're being handled um, in, in proper units. Um, we see that, say, comic strips are being preserved and individual cells are not being segmented out. And certainly, we see examples here where the bounding boxes might not be perfect, they might be redundant, or so we might be missing a bounding box for a headline here or there. But by and large, this was a real inflection point in the project in terms of realizing that it would be possible to use this visual content recognition model at scale to really try to extract visual content across the entire collection. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and talk a little bit about what the pipeline looks like for actually processing all of Chronicling America. So for uh, a given newspaper page, we can use the Chronicling America sort of infrastructure to download both the image and the corresponding OCR. We can then run the visual content recognition model, um, crop and save out all the visual content, then go into the underlying OCR to extract the captions or the corresponding textual content, um, generate some image embeddings that will become important later for visual similarity, um, and then go ahead and save all of this. <clears throat> and so this gives us really a closed loop for processing one page. Then the question became, you know, how do we actually run this across, at the time, the 16.3 million pages in Chronicling America? And um, much of the development of the code in the spring of 2020 was really devoted to this specific task of building out this pipeline. And so in total, I was able to process about 99.998% of the available pages. Um, in total, this amounted to about 100 terabytes of image and, image and XML data. Um, and this took about 19 days on these two EC2 instances from AWS, which of course have you know, very difficult names to parse. But the important thing is this was about 96 CPU cores and eight GPUs as well. Um, and so in, in total though, we were able to process pretty much all of Chronicling America. And so this resulted in the newspaper navigator data set. And I should mention here that I think really one of the, the best ways to um, take a look at the data set is to actually you know, take some slices and actually view the data set in aggregate. Um, and so um, to motivate this, um, the Chronicling America supports um, what are known as topic pages for educational resources um, to allow um, the primary source um, reference materials to be utilized from Chronicling America directly in the classroom. And so, for example, um, one, uh, one use case is um, showing maps of the American Civil War um, for educational purposes. And really previously, this would require sifting through tens of thousands of pages in Chronicling America to identify some maps by hand. Um, whereas with Newspaper Navigator, we can go ahead and say, we want all of the maps from 1861 to 1865 identified with high confidence. And here are all of the maps that are returned. And we see if we zoom in, these are all pretty much maps of the Civil War. Um, which allows us really to begin to access these kinds of questions or develop um, you know, uh, research materials quite quickly for historians and other researchers. And I will mention, you know, in addition to say supporting um, you know, civil war historians or um, um, in scholars studying the history of cartography, we'll even see that many of these um, maps are um, appearing multiple times in this visualization. And this isn't because they're being identified redundantly, but rather because these um, maps are appearing in different uh, newspaper issues or even different titles. And so this speaks to a rather interesting underlying network structure to newspapers being published at the time, this notion of a virality appearing um, sort of akin to the broad viral text project by Ryan Cordell and David Smith, but here in the context of the actual maps themselves. Um, let me go ahead and just mention some resources for the data set. Um, so if you visit news-navigator.labs.lock.gov, 
you'll find the full newspaper navigator data set um, here. Many thanks to um, LC Labs and IT Design and Development in particular um, with a colleague named Chris Adams for really making this data set available online um, and um, both accessible via computational methods. Um, so for HTTPS and S3 requests, and also for supporting what we call hundreds of prepackaged data sets, meaning that you can go in and download, say, all the maps from um, 1871 or all of the photos from 1922 in a zip file, get metadata in CSV or JSON form, no coding necessary. Um, as I mentioned in the GitHub repo for the project, we have some of the training data, for, specifically from Beyond Words um, uh, in the common objects and context format. Um, we have some notebooks for working with the data set and running the pipeline. And lastly, um, here's a pointer to uh, a conference paper that we presented at the Conference in Information Knowledge and Management 2020. And this is a bit more of just a technical paper describing the construction of the detail. Um, so um, I just, in case anybody is interested. Um, but let me go ahead and turn to um, one of the aspects of the project that um, LC Labs and I worked, worked hard on, which is ensuring that all of this is in the public domain, not just from the data set but having derived from Chronicling America, but all of the code from the project as well has been released publicly um, in the public domain for um, unrestricted use and reuse. And I'll speak to some of the ways in which we've seen some of the code in the data set reused um, by scholars and other user groups. Um, but let me go ahead and next go ahead and turn to the search application. And so now that we have this extracted visual content, well, we have these different modes of searching, but the question that I'd like to ask now is how we actually might reimagine searching over this visual content and provide new ways for scholars to be able to access the photographs in particular. And so the idea behind the Newspaper Navigator search application is uh, it's a search interface for about one and a half million photos from the Newspaper Navigator data set. Um, and generally speaking, these are all the photos from 1900 to 1963 from the data set that were identified with uh, the high confidence score. And here, the idea behind the search application, as I'll show, is to not only support um, sort of uh, keyword search over the, uh, the uh, captions, but also to try to empower users to actually retrieve visually similar content using um, some what I call AI navigators as well. And so this um, is effectively trying to surface machine learning training to the user and um, training and predicting is, is quite fast or instantaneous, meaning that this is really an iterative part of the search process. Um, but let me go ahead and actually show a demo of the search application to give some context as well. So if you go ahead and visit news-navigator.labs.lock.gov slash search, you'll find our full search portal for the, the data set. And so here we have a, a longer demo video if you're interested in learning more, but mainly here the point of access is by doing keyword search. And so here we can search by say um, location, start your end year as filters, but we can also go ahead and type in a keyword. So here I'll go ahead and type in the, the keyword baseball. And here the system is doing a search against the captions of all one and a half million photos and is identifying all the captions that contain that literal phrase baseball. And so we see about 5,400 results returned. Um, and of course, these results are quite uh, you know, diverse. We see um, these kinds of portrait shots of individuals, these team shots. Um, we see um, action poses of players, uh, photos of stadiums. And I think this speaks to one, the way in which this kind of uh, keyword search is um, you know, really returning lots of different results, but also one of the ways in which specifically for images as well, this kind of visual, uh, excuse me, this kind of textual search might be limiting. Right, we're not just honing in on one specific kind of visual um, content. And moreover, I would say that because of this literal string matching, we might be missing other relevant images that just don't contain that specific word in the, the caption. So let's say I'm really interested in these action shots in particular. I can go ahead here and actually select them. And um, let me go ahead and show one little bit of just information here. If you click an info button, um, the hope here is to really surface inf uh, information relative, uh, relevant to scholars. So here we're showing the, the photo along with its date of publication, the newspaper title that it appeared in, the corresponding caption or all of the text in that bounding box, along with the keyword highlighted in context. You can download the image, which does a IIIF request against um, Chronicling America. You can view the full issue. So if I click this, it will bring you to this specific newspaper page, uh, newspaper 
um, but published on April 24th, 1902. And then we can click through to find that newspaper pay, uh, it photograph, excuse me, in context on the page um, right here. And then also, um, excuse me, sorry, I have the uh, little Zoom panel in the way here. There we go. Um, can also learn more about the newspaper title. Um, but we also have this functionality where you can click the image and save it to a collection. And so I'll go ahead and click on some of these action poses of baseball players by clicking. And so now I've effectively stored, what, five images, which if I go to my collection tab um, are all there. And um, this is a little way of effectively bookmarking in the search application. So you can click a button called the download metadata, which will give you a spreadsheet containing um, all of the links and all of the metadata about these images. Um, and you can also click the save button, which will give you a persistent URL that you can then save or share with a friend. And that's a way of effectively preserving this collection that you've curated. But with that, let me go ahead and turn to this uh, train my AI navigators functionality, which allows us to really try to search by the visual content here in particular. So when I click this button, um, what we're finding is that um, in the top left panel here, I'm sorry, it takes a little bit of time sometimes to load the underlying images, um, but um, we're going to surface this uh, panel here where on the top left, we see all of the photos in my collection um, with this first photo in particular highlighted. On the right-hand side, we're seeing the most visually similar photos as identified using the image embeddings that I had mentioned um, to the photo selected on the left. So these are really what we might think of as the nearest neighbors. But we can go ahead and actually um, curate these examples to try to train um, uh, an AI navigator specifically to receive uh, or to identify photos of baseball players. And so here's a great example of a photo that is correct. Um, here are some photos that are not correct. And we can you know, continue to, to iterate on this process. Then when I click this button, train my AI navigators, um, we're steering the system toward the photos that are selected positively away from the negative photos. And um, this training is, um, in that time, it just trained on all of the, the examples shown and re-ranked all one and a half million photos accordingly. Um, and what we see is that even more of these photos are of baseball players. And so we see that as we steer this AI navigator, we can then begin to really retrieve uh, visual content that really resembles these kinds of action poses even though none of many of these um, actual images don't contain the phrase baseball in their underlying caption. So if we go back to the main search page, we can also apply this very much like a normal sort of facet or filter by selecting it on the left. We can then um, apply a keyword search to further filter down here. And so the idea here is to really try to provide um, a balance between uh, keyword search and this visual similarity search affordance as well to really provide new modes of access for scholars who might be interested, of course, in various um, kinds of visual motifs or other aspects of visual culture. They're typically difficult to study, or um, especially if we're looking just at um, raw newspaper pages. So with that, let me go ahead and return to the slide deck here. And um, as I had mentioned here, the uh, search application can be found here. I'm happy to drop a link to the search application in the chat as well. Um, but I very briefly just want to take one minute and explain um, this sort of uh, search paradigm from the perspective of my own dissertation in computer science. And here, um, this idea is what my advisor and I call to be open faceted search. And so the idea here is to really think about human AI interaction, where instead of just thinking about sort of a machine learning model performing um, according to precision and recall, we instead try to really think about the human and the AI system working together in this context, you know, a scholar working with the search application directly to search for relevant content. And here we're thinking about extending, you know, faceted search, which is the sort of standard search interface that um, all of us have encountered on, say, e-commerce sites or library discovery systems, where we can filter according to different categories and attributes um, to um, browse. And here we're empowering users to define um, their own facets in an open domain fashion using this kind of training of these AI navigators. And um, as was shown, you know, this performs at scale across millions of images. And um, we have a, a demo that appeared at a CS conference called um, WIST. Um, here's a link to it. Um, but we're currently working on this in more detail, in particular, <clears throat> looking at the online usage 
over about the, the past two years since launching. I should mention that we launched the search application in September of 2020. And so we've been able to, to monitor sort of broad usage trends as well. And so we've had about 42,000 um, unique sessions um, where someone has performed at least one non-empty keyword search. And um, we've had hundreds of these unique um, sessions uh, train one of these uh, uh, open facets, or at least one of them. Um, and interestingly, about 80% of these open facets that users have trained using these AI navigators rely outside of the standard ImageNet 1000 taxonomy of you know, dog, cat, bicycle, these kinds of categories, which really suggests that lots of scholars and other users have really nuanced um, types of uh, content that they're trying to retrieve, uh, but might not be able to do so using normal methodologies. And so here users really wanna have this kind of functionality. And I'll mention that I'm currently really trying to work on evaluating the sort of facet performance and responsiveness using this kind of broad usage trends as well. Um, and so hopefully we'll be putting out a paper in the coming months on this work. Um, with that, let me go ahead and just briefly turn to some of the places that we've seen Newspaper Navigator used. So in the spring of 2020, before we launched the search application, when we launched the data set itself, um, this was, of course, right after the start of COVID. And so what had initially been planned for an in-person event rapidly moved on to Zoom. Um, but we had participants, uh, about 180 from uh, across the United States, interact with the search application, uh, excuse me, with the data set um, and start to um, uh, you know, visualize tons of photographs, create collages of interesting um, photos, um, produce Jupyter notebooks for working with the data. And this was really encouraging uh, because I think if gave us a new perspective on what actual scholars wanted to use the data set for. Um, we've seen um, the project used in um, digital history contexts in programming historian. Um, so Daniel Van Streen has put together some tutorials for deep learning uh, with historical images using the Newspaper Navigator data set, and has also written some, some code wrappers for working with the Newspaper Navigator data as well. Um, we've had uh, students um, produce D3 visualizations for um, identifying visual content based on the location of publication. Um, we've had uh, students train GANs on the newspapers um, as uh, sort of class projects. Um, and I will just mention some of the other use cases that we've seen. So um, the maps have been featured on map blogs or cartography blogs as well. Um, I've worked with um, the professors of education, Eileen and Michael Burson to study machine, uh, the newspaper navigator search application in the social studies classroom um, in primary school education. And so our piece um, uh, called Machine Learning and Social Studies appeared in um, the journal Social Education. Um, and we've also seen it being um, uh, you know, discussed in this educational context. So here's a podcast um, produced by Tom Bober about using it as an educator. Um, and lastly, we've seen some really interesting um, use cases actually by genealogists as well in the United States. And so we've actually had um, uh, the cases where people have found photos of relatives, such as grandparents in the search application. Um, and I just want to also mention the sort of institutional context behind Newspaper Navigator. Of course, as I mentioned, you know, this project was very much in collaboration with uh, uh, the staff at the Library of Congress and required coordination across different um, directorates and divisions. And so we collaborated to contribute an article to Europeana Tech Insight about how we worked sort of across these different departments to make Newspaper Navigator possible. Um, but with that, let me go ahead and use the last bit of my presentation here to talk about Newspaper Navigator in the context of the digital humanities, and in particular, uh, digital history, but we're taking a wider view as well. And so I'm going to speak very briefly here about um, a few different applications of Newspaper Navigator and collaborations with uh, print scholars in particular. So the first um, a question that I'd like to ask here is how we might use Newspaper Navigator to help us uncover or quote unquote see editors in ethnic presses in Chronicling America. And so this work with um, my, my wonderful colleagues, uh, Jim Casey, Sarah Salter, Joshua ortiz Baco, and Molly Hardy, who have such a wealth of expertise um, related to um, periodicals in the United States. So let me go ahead and take a step back here and um, visualize um, using Chronicling America here, the front page of the Opelousas Courier, a newspaper published out of Louisiana from 1907 to 1908. And here the idea 
is to um, get a sense of what the newspaper front page looks like over time. And what we see, of course, is that there are some, um, you know, re recurring um, uh, locations of where we might expect um, various features to be. So we see headlines appearing near the top of the page, um, photos and illustrations in the top center. Um, we see a band of advertisements appearing on the right hand side. And this, of course, is communicating a sort of um, visual grammar to the newspaper page or the, the mise en page. And so this gives us really a, a sense of what a newspaper reader might expect when they uh, get the front page of this title or were, well, when they would have, you know, over 100 years ago. And this speaks to um, this kind of visual grammar that we see across different newspaper titles. And so while this might just be a trend that we could take a look at by eye um, using this kinds of visualizations, we can actually use the newspaper navigator to, uh, data set to quantify this because we know the locations of say the advertisements on the newspaper page. And so what I'm showing here is for every year from 1870 to 1909, I'm taking all the advertisements on these front pages, stacking them up. Um, and so the darker, the blue on the image uh, on this, this box here, that corresponds to uh, more likely to have seen the advertisement in that region of the page. And so this is normalized across all of the pages from that given year. Um, but we see here, generally speaking, is um, you know, for at the bottom here, 1906 to 1907, that really narrow band of advertisements appearing as we had seen. And so this really does allow us to really read these newspapers in almost a distant, uh, distant viewing kind of way. Um, but we can not only go and take a view of one newspaper uh, at a time, but we can actually compare titles because now we can effectively compare the sort of similarity across the locations of uh, advertisements or photographs as well, and use this to try to infer this kind of different titles that share really similar editorial layouts or page layouts. And so here's a visualization of, of ethnic presses in Chronicling America. And so here, this is produced by using this sort of distance metric that I had mentioned and um, producing a visualization with um, TSNE for dimensionality reduction. And here I'll mention, you know, one example cluster that we might uncover here um, is shown in this small region of three um, newspaper titles, the Washington Bee, the Appeal, and the Colored American, all of which are um, titles of the African American press. And what we find is if we look at some example front pages, they all share a very similar front page sort of layout. We see the title flag at the top, followed by then, um, you know, in the center of the page, um, illustrations, um, sort of a portraits of Ill, uh, prominent members of the local communities. And this really does speak to sort of a shared communicated visual grammar among these different newspaper titles um, that um, really seem to indicate some notion of community as well. And so, um, you know, this is just one such cluster, but I'll mention that we presented this work at the Computational Humanities Research Conference 2021, and that we're um, working on an extension of this and have a, uh, an article that'll be forthcoming in the um, journal, American Journal called Criticism, and is specifically thinking about new approaches to critical bibliography and the material text. So second, I wanna go ahead and turn to the question of how we might use Newspaper Navigator to study um, Ladino newspapers at scale for the first time. And I'll mention here that this portion of my work was supported by the Strom Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington, in particular through the uh, Richard and Ina Wilner Memorial Fellowship and um, was in collaboration with the Strom Center um, quite, quite heavily. And so the idea here is um, for context, um, Ladino is the language of the Sephardic Jewish people. And just as Yiddish is sort of a hybrid of um, German and Hebrew, um, Ladino is a hybrid of Spanish and Hebrew. And so if we view a newspaper page of a, of a prominent Ladino newspaper published in New York um, called Lavara, we see that the newspaper is actually typeset in um, Hebrew or Rashi script, um, even though it reads phonetically much like Spanish. And this actually presents some interesting challenges from the perspective of OCR, because typically off the shelf algorithms will, will parse this as Hebrew and actually sort of um, muck up the underlying OCR, meaning that it's really hard to do keyword search across Ladino text or do textual analysis. And there are people currently working on this certainly, um, but sort of historically, it's been a real challenge for scholars and has been quite limiting um, in terms of requiring really uh, manual uh, research or, you know, reading each page at a time. So the question that I, I asked with the, the Strom Center and, and colleagues was, you know, what happens if we instead try to shift 
record the visual content on these newspaper pages using that visual content recognition model to extract visual content, sort of provide a macroscopic scale over these newspaper pages. And so in total was able to utilize the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Sephardic Studies Digital Library at the University of Washington and process about 15,000 pages of Ladino titles um, spanning about 50 years and spanning continents as well. And um, I just wanna very briefly um, talk about some trends of the extracted visual content that we found in trying to use visual similarity. So here what I'm showing is effectively these kinds of cluster maps of visual similarity um, using those similar image embeddings to what powered the newspaper navigator search application, except this time I'm um, using TSNE to allow us to really visualize them. And so what we find here are many clusters that seem really rich for, um, for their study. Um, in particular, we see lots of portrait shots of individuals and photos of communities that I think really speak to the ways in which these uh, Ladino newspapers um, serve specific functions within local communities um, in, in diasporic role, um, situations. Um, and I also want to talk about in Lavara some of these um, extracted advertisements, um, which uh, seem to have been published in um, newspaper issue after newspaper issue of Lavara. And um, for context, the advertisements in Ladino newspapers in particular have been a source of scholarship from, say, Sarah Stein in her book, Making Jews Modern, to really try to use these advertisements to understand the anxieties of um, the Sephardic Jewish experience. And um, many of the advertisements that she found are similar um, kinds of advertisements we began to find at scale here extracted or, you know, being found being printed in issue after issue. And so this really lends credence to some of the scholarship um, being done surrounding advertisements. Um, and I'll mention that this work um, just appeared in um, the, the book volume of Jewish Studies in the Digital Age, um, published by Dicker Writer Press. Um, but lastly here, I wanna go ahead and talk about um, sort of unpacking the socio-technical implications of Newspaper Navigator as a project. And so certainly there are all sorts of ways in which digitization and machine learning really mediate um, the final search and discovery in that search application that a historian might encounter. And the goal behind what I call this uh, data archeology span as, um, as an article is to really try to use um, some specific newspaper pages um, to use as a case study to try to unpack all the ways in which the newspaper page is decontextualized and the images are altered. And so here I ended up using these four pages of Black newspapers in Chronicling America, all of which that reproduce the same photo of W.E.B. Du Bois, um, which as cropped out and shown here, um, really already seemed to vary rather drastically based on the microfilming and uh, digitization as well. Um, but let me go ahead and um, sort of unpack some of the ways in which choices surrounding machine learning and digitization impact the resulting photographs. So here's one newspaper page, um, and we're showing these different cuts on those bounding boxes based on confidence score. So we see if we use a rather you know, uh, lenient threshold of 5% on confidence score, we get a whole bunch of noise on these bounding boxes. And as we progressively take um, more and more stringent cuts on confidence score, we see the visual content recognized actually changing. And this, of course, tells us that this cut on visual content, something that seems rather, rather innocuous, even that has a profound impact of what is embedded in the resulting data set. Um, if we look at these four images and look at the transcriptions, of OCR transcriptions of the captions, we see that actually all four of them do not perfectly capture the W.E.B. Du Bois PhD caption. Um, at all have at least one letter or character that's been altered. And this problem is actually made even worse if we rely on just all of the text falling within these bounding boxes. We see, especially for that photo from the broad axe, the third one, we get a lot of underlying noise from where it seems like the OCR algorithm tried to read the actual, um, you know, other parts of the image that don't have text. Um, we can then try to say what happens if we look at using visual similarity to recover these images. Um, so here's a very similar TSD visualization where we might find crowds or photos of ships in the sea. We try to recover those photos of W.E.B. Du Bois. We find that one of the photos shown on the bottom left is actually not associated with the others or retrieved sort of similarly through as or recognized as visually similar. This is because the image is so saturated from the microfilming process. And so what we find, of course, is that whether we try to recover these images via textual um, search, uh, via visual search, we always have on sort of limiting ways. Um, and thinking about the ways in which machine learning impacts this kind of search, I think is a really important consideration 
And so we, uh, I released an initial version of this with the search application, um, but a peer reviewed version has since appeared in um, the journal Digital Humanities Quarterly. And lastly, I want to turn to um, one of the ongoing aspects of this project um, from this perspective, which is really trying to think through how we can um, begin to uh, apply machine learning to cultural heritage and um, uh, you know, thinking about ways of providing guiding questions or guidelines for doing this work. And so here I have introduced what I call the collections as uh, machine learning data checklist for machine learning and cultural heritage. And the idea here is to draw on a lot of the um, really exciting projects that I've seen in the space. I know you mentioned that there are um, many uh, machine learning projects that you all have seen in the uh, colloquium over the semester. And um, certainly similar to me, Bob, for me, you know, seeing these really rich projects that people have come up with, it seems as though there's some shared questions surrounding, um, you know, data, data being used, um, considerations about machine learning models being applied, broader organizational considerations and beyond. And so the idea behind this checklist, sort of borrowing from this paradigm in machine learning, of uh, trying to create guiding questions or principles um, in order to document um, a project's sort of uh, for various considerations, um, this checklist is meant to help um, either machine learning practitioners or humanists engaging with cultural heritage and machine learning. Um, and so um, the, the, the preprint of this is available online. Um, but with that, you know, I uh, recognize that it's probably a good time to go ahead and wrap up toward questions. So I'll mention again, you know, some resources for the project. Again, happy to provide these in the chat. But I do just want to take some time and, and thank um, a whole host of uh, colleagues who have made this project possible at LC Labs, um, IT Design and Development, and the National Digital Newspaper Program at the Library of Congress for making this um, you know, possible in so many ways. Um, of course, the Chronicling America is the result of decades of newspaper work at the Library of Congress and beyond. And um, of course, I benefited greatly from all of the volunteers in the Beyond Words initiative as well. Um, here, I would really very much like to thank my advisor, Professor Daniel Weld, at the University of Washington and the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, really supporting this work and um, for being, um, you know, for, for lending expertise and really providing so many insights throughout this development. Um, and thank you a whole host of external collaborators as well. And I'll lastly end by just mentioning that this research is based upon work supported by a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, the Library of Congress Innovator in Residence position, and the Richard and Ina Wilner Memorial uh, Fellowship. And um, I please do feel free to reach out. You know, I'm really excited to discuss uh, questions here, but here's my email. I'm always more than happy to follow up or talk offline. Um, but of course, with that, let me go ahead and turn it over to questions.